five, four, three, hands on keys, turn. If Morpheus was right, then there's no way I can pull this plug. I mean, if Neo's the one, then there'd have to be some kind of miracle to stop me, right? I mean, how can he be the one if he's dead? You never did answer me before. Look into his eyes, those big, pretty blue eyes. Tell me, yes or no. That's Cypher from The Matrix when he's taunting Trinity. And uh, welcome to part three of Joseph Campbell's monomyth, The Hero's Journey. And it looks like there probably will not be a part four. It looks like I'm going to be able to crunch through this material in, in uh, this third part. And we'll be able to get through this and everything. It's a lot of fun. So uh, I'm just going to do a brief recap of The Hero's Journey uh, up until this point because we left off... Uh, midway through during the Supreme Ordeal, uh, during the last time. So uh, a hero sets out from the ordinary world. Uh, they get a call to adventure that you know invites them to go on there. Uh, they get an opportunity to refuse the call. If they refuse the call, story's over. Uh, so they generally do not refuse the call. They, they press on. They meet a mentor or supernatural aid or some kind of thing. And they uh, go to the first threshold where they encounter a threshold guardian uh, that is some kind of, you know, uh, the first of many opponents that they're going to face. And they enter the road of trials where, along with their allies, they face a bunch of tests and proceed on to the supreme ordeal. And in between there, there's there's some, you know, other stages uh the uh, approach to the inmost cave or the belly of the whale, as some people call it, uh, et cetera. But we're, we're going to gloss over those very quickly. And just when you get to the nadir of the mythic circle, um, and, and incidentally, there's uh, that, that circle thing just brought to mind. Uh, Dan Harmon, who does Community and Rick and Morty and everything, he has uh, a YouTube video that he did on what he calls, I think, the story circle. And he is talking about the same thing. So uh, go check that out on YouTube. If you type in uh, Dan Harmon story circle or something like that, it should come up. Uh, and check that out. It's, it's short. It's substantially shorter. I think it's only 10 minutes long. But he covers a lot of the same material uh, in probably a much more witty way because he's Dan Harmon. But anyway, when you reach the nadir of the supreme uh of the story circle you get to the supreme ordeal and we covered the first two which were um sometimes called meeting with the goddess or woman is a temptress uh i prefer the term like sacred marriage um and then atonement with the father so that leaves the other two uh apotheosis and elixir theft so we're going to cover we're going to start off with that right now and let me just like move these pages around because they're deciding to be problematic. And uh, so that's why I started with that quote um, from Cypher, because um, apotheosis means exaltation to divine rank or stature, deification. So the hero becomes godlike, like unto a god. Uh, in the sense that afterwards they're capable of feats and acts which surpass their old selves and other normal beings. And the Matrix is a great, great example of this. Because in the Matrix, once Neo comes to recognize the divinity with him, within himself, that he is the one, Neo, of course, being an anagram for one, um, the power that he already contained within himself, once he believes that he's the one, he's literally unstoppable. He can do he can do whatever. 
Um, that's not quite the part of the story, you know, where Cypher is saying that, where Neo discovers he's the one. He actually starts to believe that he is the one when he faces a threshold guardian. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but apotheosis essentially is the beginning of the hero's recognition of the divine or the special within themselves. It's the beginning of a hero with a capital H. Um, it, it's, it's essentially the beginning of why, they're, why the story is about them and not somebody else. You know, it's, it's like, well, it's about this hero because this hero cannot, can accomplish uh, that which ordinary people cannot. And that's what the stage of apotheosis is. It's, it's like leveling up and becoming a real threat to the adversarial powers. Oftentimes in a story, this is the first time that uh, an adversarial power will take the hero seriously. Because up until this point, they've sent a bunch of henchmen. They're just like, you know, quit bothering about this dude, whatever, etc. And usually after this scene, you'll get a scene where the henchman comes back to the big bad guy and goes, oh, I'm, you know, and the bad guy's like, oh, yeah, did you take care of young hero? And the henchman will be like, oh, a thousand apologies, master, but uh, they escaped again or they beat us again or whatever. You'll get that scene usually right after this. And then, you know, the bad guy's like, okay, send everybody or or I have to do it myself or whatever, you know. Um, so this is uh, in a video game. This is going to be right after your first really big boss battle when you start getting all kinds of uh, power-ups. That's, that's what happens here. It's, it's just an interesting phase. Happens in a lot of stories. Again, with these Supreme Ordeal stories, The Sacred Marriage, uh, Atonement with the Father, Apotheosis, and Elixir Theft, not all of them occur in every story. So don't, don't be looking for them in every story. Sometimes... Uh, only one occurs. Sometimes it's, it's, you know, multiple, but not, they're not required to occur. Even if you're following the, the, uh, monomyth as a checklist, as often a lot of people do. So the next one is called elixir theft. And sometimes I've seen this as, as spelled out as the ultimate boon, which is probably, probably a more accurate way of describing it, because this is going to be where the hero gets their hands on whatever it was the quest was probably about. Uh, this is the rescuing the, uh, the princess or the captive person or whatever. I say, I say rescuing the princess because I'm thinking of Star Wars A New Hope and also every other princess rescue story that's out there. But in um, the 2009 Star Trek remake... Um, they, you know, J.J. Abrams did not use a princess. He used the uh, the former captain of the Enterprise, uh, rescuing him from a planet killer, which is the same thing as the Death Star. So it was pretty lazy, uh, pretty lazy storytelling on his part, since he just essentially took uh, a new hope and uses a checklist to tell a Star Trek story. But it illustrates the point that that's where you're gonna, that's going to happen. Um, in the ultimate boon or elixir theft, uh, there's, there's really two things that can happen. That's why I say that the ultimate boon is probably a more accurate word or a way to name this stage. Uh, it could be that the hero has passed all the tests and earned their way to the prize. Uh, and, uh, and the, the powers that be were only hostile to the hero because it was like a test. You know, it was like, oh, hey, yeah, well, we didn't want, you know, we didn't want to kill all the other heroes and everything like that. But you can't just waltz in here and ask for this, you know, power. Uh, you have to earn it. So you you uh, you come in and and oftentimes you'll see a scene like this where where the person, the hero comes in and the in they're confronted with a guardian of whatever treasure it is. And the guardian will usually give it up freely. The guardian will be like, hey, you know, you made it. Like, 
you're the first one who's made it here in a thousand years or something, you know, something like that. And they'll hand it over willingly. Uh, the easiest example I can see of this, and it's a little bit of a cheat because it's right, it's in the, it's towards the third act of the film. So it's, it doesn't occur at the right spot, but it is a perfect example is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Uh, he makes it past literally all the tests, you know, walking in the name of God, the penitent man kneels before God, the leap of faith, all that stuff. He makes it through the test. It's like a, it's a little hero's journey in microcosm, right? Once they get to Alexandretta, to Iskenderun, and they're walking into uh, Petra, and he has to pass all these tests, and his dad had all the clues in the, in the Grail Diary, and he passes all the tests, and he makes it into the inmost cave. Um, yeah, they're, they're not very subtle when they, when they do these things. It's, it's fairly obvious if you, when you know what you're looking for. Um, but he makes it through the inmost cave, and there is a guardian. A knight, an immortal knight who has been there for a thousand years or more. And he is guarding the Holy Grail. And of course, there's one last test that you have to pass. And of course, everybody else fails. Indy chooses the right cup. And that's the final test. And the guardian says, you have chosen wisely. And Indy earned the cup. Now, granted, there's, there's an extra little caveat to that that you can't leave that area with it it cannot cross the seal or it creates all kinds of havoc but he's able to get the cup back and save his father um so that's a really really good example of like the boon being freely given but far more common in in at least western modern storytelling is elixir theft and it's exactly what it sounds like. And the best example, like, it's not the best example, but it's a good example, is in The Hobbit. And uh, Bilbo has descended into the lair of the dragon, the inmost cave, belly of the whale, et cetera, et cetera. And he's having a conversation with Smaug. And he gets Smaug in his vanity to, like, roll over on his back and bare his chest. And this happens. Old fool, why there is a large patch in the hollow of his left breast as bare as a snail out of its shell. After he'd seen that, Mr. Baggins' one idea was to get away. Well, I really must not detain your magnificence any longer, he said. Or keep you from much needed rest. Ponies take some catching, I believe, after a long start. And so do burglars, he added as a parting shot, as he dashed back and fled up the tunnel. And that's from The Hobbit, of course, by uh, J.R. Tolkien. And it's Bilbo, the theft of the, the elixir there is that Smaug is not invulnerable. And he's able to tell a thrush, and the thrush uh, flies down, or a raven, I think. Uh, no, it's a thrush. And then he goes down and, and tells Bard. And Bard knows where to look to fire the black arrow. And it's too late for Lake Town, but he does get rid of Smaug. Um, so elixir theft is... It's stealing the elixir. Uh, the power is the bee of something the hero wants or needs. You, that's what the quest is all about. They're not going to give it up. So the, the hero has to bypass all the threshold guardians, get into the inner sanctum, and steal what he, he or she needs. Uh, this is Prometheus, stealing fire and bringing it to mankind. Um, Bilbo creeping in the smog's den um, to return with the dragon's only weakness. Uh, this is uh, Neo uh, busting in and saving Morpheus. That's a, actually a really a good example. Uh, instead of like a rescue princess scene, it's rescuing Morpheus scene, you know, but it's the same thing. Um, so it's Neo breaking into the, the headquarters. We get that really cool action scene. We get to see Neo starting to do things that normal people cannot do at all. Um, and he steals Morpheus, and more importantly, the Zion codes that are in Morpheus's head. Um, even though Neo doesn't really care about those, but he cares about Morpheus. But that's really what the machines had Morpheus for in the first place. They didn't. They would have just killed him, but they thought they could get the Zion codes out of his head. Um, it's Luke, of course, going back to A New Hope. It's so I go. I I use A New Hope as a crutch because it is so easy to map to this because Lucas 
used this as a checklist when he was writing A New Hope. Um, he used it as a formula. And so this is Luke escaping from the Death Star with not only the princess, but more importantly, the Death Star plans. The, the real elixir there are the Death Star plans. I mean, Leia was in a, a bad spot, to put it mildly, beforehand, but she was kind of uh, handling herself. She was going toe-to-toe with Tarkin and Vader and um, essentially rescued herself. I mean, Luke opened the cell door, and then she was just like, you guys are a bunch of idiots who are going to get us all killed, and do what I tell you to do and follow me. <laughs> and and uh, they did, so they get away. But the the real elixir in that scene is actually the Death Star plans. That That's what they actually steal, which is kind of goofy when you stop and think about it because the plans were in, the, in R2 all along, you know, that kind of thing. But it's like they brought the plans into, into, the, um, into the Death Star inadvertently because they were trying to get to Alderaan. Now they had to get them back out, you know what I mean? And uh, so that's, that's really what's going on. They do rescue the princess in, 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 the, uh, in the event of that. So uh, needless to say, the uh, powers that be, the enemy powers are angry and they're very wrathful right after this happens because their great boon that they've been guarding or, you know, protecting or the secret that they never wanted to get out is going to get out. And so they need to stop the hero at all costs at this point, because what the hero is going to do 99% of the time is return the elixir to the ordinary world. I mean, that's the whole point of the whole thing, you know, is, is to go get the boon, bring, get fire or the magic runes or whatever it is that they were trying to go get and bring it back. So the, the, and of course the bad guys don't want them to be back. And so they'll just be like, Hey, this is, um, this is not okay. We need to stop this guy at all costs. This is when they will pull out all the stops and send everything after the hero. Uh, so we get to a stage. Um, it's called uh, basically the road back. And it is a continuation of the road of trials. And they're going to head back now to the ordinary world. This is usually the end of act two. It does not last a real long time uh, because we get into another phase that's very, very quick. Uh, that is along the road of trials and it is called flight. Uh, and the, the best, you know, the best example of this, again, a new hope just comes to the rescue every single time. It's when Han Solo turns to Luke and Luke is sad because he's like, Hey, uh, I just lost Ben. You know, uh, we thought we were triumphal, but Ben just got killed. And Han comes in and goes, come on, buddy. We're not out of this yet. That's flight. That's um, the hero's triumph during the Supreme Ordeal and uh, has passed more and more tests and has beaten all the Threshold Guardians. And keep in mind, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a second, but these Threshold Guardians are not the ones that were at the beginning that were like, hey, you know, that you could just get by by literally waving your hand and, you, and saying these aren't the droids you're looking for. These are some serious Threshold Guardians that are showing up now. So the... Um, Two possibilities can can turn out during this flight phase. Uh, the hero may have won the favor of the powers, you know, and that's if they they won the boon, fair and square kind of thing, and the powers have have given him or her the elixir freely, and and um, and, and you know they've given him their blessing, and he's or she is returning to the world to heal it. And in such a case, uh, the final stage of the adventure and the return of the ordinary world is supported by the powers. So you will get flight still, and you'll still get some more tests and threshold guardians, but they'll usually come from a rival or from, you know, natural obstacles or even maybe the, the uh, hero uh, themselves. And we'll, we'll talk about this phase briefly in a moment. Uh, but if, if on the other hand, which is most of the time in like modern Western stories, uh, the elixir has been stolen and the powers are angry, uh, they'll send everything they have at the hero. And so they, they've been slighted and cheated out of it. Uh, 
they have to destroy the hero at all costs. That essentially is flight. So for the hero, this is really, really bad because capture means uh, probably proverbial and probably literal death. Uh, not good. But this is where your big chase scene is going to happen. Uh, this is, and in a romantic comedy, this is going to be moved later on. It's kind of weird. It's usually at the end of, uh, towards the end of act three and it'll be the running scene. And I think in the first episode I talked about that, but in a romantic comedy, especially modern romantic comedies, there will be a scene where the hero has done something that's, uh, annoyed the object of the, of their desire and they're going to leave and they're, they're gone. And once they leave, they're completely out of the hero's reach. There's at this point in the story, there's no such thing as like smartphones or, or email or anything. Once this person gets on the plane or gets in the car or gets on the train or whatever, they are gone for the rest rest of their you know the rest of life you're never going to see this person again so the hero will be running through uh a crowd or there was always a running scene essentially and and there'll be minor threshold guardians you know that'll just be standing here that standing in the way that the hero like knocks to the ground or or shoves aside or something you know and they'll just be like hey what's the big hurry you know and say something lame like that or whatever but next time you watch a romantic comedy look for that scene it's generally there but flight is also your big car chase this is you know um it's it's a uh, in heat it's a little bit more complicated because you're rooting you have two sets of protagonists right so you have the cops and you have the robbers so um, the robbers have gotten their big bank robbery and they're stepping out. And if you're watching the film from kind of the bank robbers point of view, this is flight. It's a huge, massive gun battle that happens. Um, it's actually pretty incredible. So in flight for the police story is different because they are trying to catch, uh, Robert De Niro's character before he gets completely away. So it's, it, it's a really, uh, if you haven't seen heat, uh, check it out. It is not only an excellent film, but for, but from a story structural point of view, it is really great to try to sit down and analyze what's going on in that movie and when, cause they move a lot of things around. Cause there's, there's two sets of protagonists, two different heroes journeys are going on and are overlapped on top of one another. It's a brilliant, brilliant film. Um, and of course, as we already covered, the the example of flight, you know, is the the uh, in a new hope, they they are chased by a flight of Tie Fighters that they have to fight, and uh, in uh, in the Matrix, uh, flight takes place with Neo and Morpheus and and uh, Trinity getting getting to uh, you know an exit. And then, you know, they're, they're fighting all kinds of different stuff and the agents are turning in or regular people are turning into agents and trying to stop them. And then finally the, uh, final, you know, Neo is stuck in the matrix and has to face the final agent. And that brings me to, uh, not only like the road back, but, um, the threshold struggle. That and I'm kind of jumping ahead here, so I need to I need to come back. But it's it's a it's a basically crossing the re return threshold where these pretty impressive threshold guardians will show up. So uh, a good example uh, is you know uh, in in Star Wars again, A New Hope. I know I'm using that as a crutch, but it's like when Leia is like, "They let us go." It's the only explanation for the ease of our escape. Easy? You call that easy? They're tracking us, not this ship, sister. That's the road back. You know, they've they've escaped that initial uh, chase. They're headed back to Yavin 4. It looks like they're home free. And so the, the road back um, happens. There's, there's a couple different things that happen here. And some of these, this is almost like the Supreme Ordeal, but some of these happen later or earlier or get, and not all of these happen like in every story. So the road back consists of really kind of four phases. 
the return, resurrection, rescue, and rescue from without, sometimes it's called, and threshold struggle. Uh, so any one of these can apply. All of them can apply. This will be the beginning of Act 3. Um, and if it isn't Act 3, it's usually the climax of the story. So the return part of the road back marks the transition from Act 2 to Act 3. Uh, the hero is crossing back over from the special world to the ordinary world in the Greek myth of Orpheus. Cross back from the land of the dead back into the land of the living is a really good example. Uh, big chase sequence right here uh, along with the flight. You know, it'll carry right over into the return. It'll blend right in there. Um, the Battle of the Five Armies is a good example of this because Smaug is dead. So it's like, hey, everyone rejoice and everything. And then now here come the men of, of uh, Lake Town, you know, who come up and go, hey, our town is destroyed. And you're sitting on this big pile of loot. Like, you want to share? And then the elves show up and they're like, hey, you know, the dragon brought us a whole mess of pain and we want reparations. And the dwarves are just like, no. Like, and they're like, but Bard killed the dragon. And he's like, we don't care. <laughs> and leads to the Battle of the Five Armies. You know, that's that's where this is, like, taking place. Um, it, it, it's a continuation of flight. It, it'll go from flight right into the return. Um, the hero will also discover that the enemy powers are not entirely vanquished. Uh, so they're going to have to, they're going to have to dig deep. For This is the last round, you know, in Rocky movies or whatever. They're going to have to dig deep and finish off the opponent. So resurrection comes into play where at some point it will seem as if the hero has died or comes very, very near death. And the Peter Jackson, Lord of the Rings films abused this. And I think they were just counting on people like not knowing the books or something. But there are so many fake deaths. And it's one of the few things I don't like about those movies is there's like a billion and a half fake deaths where people are almost dead. But like in Fellowship of the Ring... Super easy example is uh, Frodo and Sam are making their way away while the Urukai are, you know, uh, stitching Boromir up with a bunch of arrows and and Merry and Pippin are getting carried off and Sam and Frodo are getting away in a boat and Frodo tips over the side and sinks and Sam has to jump in and rescue him because it looks like Frodo is going to drown. Um so that's a good example of that scene. And in in a romantic comedy, this is that this is uh the last shot, you know. Uh something will happen generally, everything works out just fine, but this is that last bit where you'll have, you know, the hero has done his running scene uh and thinks that he's found his girl and turns her around and it's the wrong girl oh no you know uh you know it's her best friend or whatever that was wearing the same color jacket or something contrived like that and then you know you and then you'll find out usually within a minute or 30 seconds it's really really fast in film uh that oh yeah well his his girl is standing right next to her or something like that you know it's like it, it'll work out all just fine um and in the Battle of Five Armies, you know, it's since we use that example, it's OK, we're all going to go to war now. You know what I mean? And uh, in the Rankin and Bass version, uh, the men are actually uh, uh, I think it's the men. It might. No, it's the dwarves. They're, they're actually chanting, kill the men, kill the elves, save the gold for ourselves. Right. And then they hear horns. And you're like, oh. What what are those about? And Gandalf shows up in the middle of the thing, and and he's like an army of of orcs ri riding wargs is coming right here. And literally within ten seconds of him saying that, uh, they turn around. They're like, you know, Elf King, my truest friend and ally. You know, <laughs> they were ready to like butcher each other. Uh, 30 seconds before, but now they're like, oh no, there's there's like goblins and wargs coming here. We have to ally against those guys. They're really bad. So it kind of works out, you know. Um, and then, you know, this is where the eagles show up. Like in Return of the King, 
Uh, all is lost. The heroes are dead. Mount Doom. They've they've done what they needed to do. Mount Doom's erupting. They're going to be subsumed by lava. Here come the eagles. Right. So, um, in in Star Wars: A New Hope, because we have to go there. Right. Um, this is the moment where Vader goes. I have you now. He's got Luke's in his sights. He's already figured out, hey, the Force is strong in this one, right? So he's locked him up, and he goes, I have you now. And then, boom, the TIE fighter next to him blows up. Luke Vader loses control, goes spinning off, and Han goes, Yahoo, you're all clear, kid. Blow this thing so we can go home, right? <laughs> and that's rescue from without that usually comes after resurrection. This is this is Han diving out of the sun in the Millennium Falcon at the last minute. This is Sam pulling Frodo out of the water. Um, and you'll realize these all happen kind of late in the story. And that's why I said these don't necessarily have to happen right where we said it would happen, right after flight. And the last phase takes us back a bit on the circle, right? Because these other ones kind of happen out of order in the examples that I used. Right. So it's threshold struggle. And sometimes it's called uh, the more accurate name is uh, crossing the return threshold. This is usually where the hero is going to cross back over into the ordinary world, but they're going to be stopped. Right. Because the power, the powers are not just going to be like, eh, well, you can go back. You stole from me. You, you became a god. And now we're just going to let you go unless, um, and like I said, unless they granted the hero, the boon, in which case the story, the, the, this last parts that we're talking about, if the hero passed all the tests and gets the boon, the story usually ramps down very, very quickly. And, in, in especially in film, they'll just be like, yay, he achieved it, whatever. And, and movies over, you know, it's, it, it'll be very, very quick. Um, this is. I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to think of a good example for that, but uh, it's not coming to mind. I, I, I want to think that uh, at least one or two of the Harry Potter films, the early ones, are exactly like that, where once, it might be Chamber of Secrets. Um, I think it's the one with, with the basilisk, where they find the first Horcrux, but they, once that's done, the movie's essentially over. It's it's over very very quickly after that, um, so the um to jump back to this threshold struggle, uh, that this might be an internal battle. Uh, there's a condition that is probably the rarest of the conditions to show up in the in the monomyth in modern Western storytelling, and it is a condition known as refusal of the return. And it's where the hero has gone and done all these things and achieved the boon or became a god or had sacred marriage or atonement with their father and doesn't feel like returning to the real world at all. They're just like, you know what? Um, I'm doing a lot better here. And it's, it, it, that story very seldomly shows up because it has kind of a hint of selfishness that the hero has now achieved this, but they're just like, you know what? The heck with the rest of the world. They don't deserve the boon. I got it, and I'm going to stay. So in Western storytelling, this turns into um, kind of a selfish hero, which will lead to usually a villain. Um, they'll be, they will turn into the bad guy who was the hero, who the hero, who the hero of the current story runs into, and they'll run into this person and be like, hey, you were so-and-so and you went after the, you know, after the, the, the boon and you, I, everyone thought you were dead. No, no, I've had it and I've been living here all along. Well, we need to bring it back. No, we don't. And if you try to bring it back, you're going to ruin everything for me. So now I'm going to stop you. Uh, it's that kind of story of a refusal, refusal of the return, or you'll have a story where it's not really refusal of return, return, but the return is delayed substantially. So the hero will go and, uh, go into the other world, discover that they really like it there and they do really well there and decide that they're not coming back to the ordinary world. 
But what usually happens in those stories is later on, when the hero is a lot older or a lot of time has passed or something, they will realize that they have to go back to their ordinary world. And this is, um, I think, I think the, the uh, story of Tiernan Oog, uh fits that. Uh, and, and like I said, this stage is extremely, it, it's kind of rare. Um, one of the ones I can think of that fits in is the musical Brigadoon. So in the musical Brigadoon, there's a modern man goes, he finds this village that kind of magically appears only like once every hundred years or something like that. And, uh, he goes into this magical world and falls in love with Bonnie Jean and is that's that's awesome that's great but he doesn't belong there and they're kind of an anachronism because they're they're out of time they 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 are still using like 16th century technology and stuff so but he discovers that hey this is this is really what he wanted but he doesn't discover that until he's left he he's left the village he goes back to the modern world and he's miserable. He returns to the city and he, he hates it. Um, and then, big spoiler for those who haven't seen it, uh, he winds up returning to the location. And his love for Bonnie Jean actually brings the village back long enough for him to go, go join them again. And he actually just leaves the, uh, he leaves the ordinary world. You know, not looking back. That's, that's an example. Um and then also with refusal to return, sometimes what happens is the hero may deem that the ordinary world isn't worthy of the elixir that they're bringing back. Um, so the hero either doesn't return because they have like a secret or they've learned something and they go, you know what, this is, this is not going to work out in the ordinary world. Or they return, but abandon the elixir. They leave the elixir where they found it. Uh, an example of that, and this is some reaching back here, um, is Raise the Titanic. Uh, it's kind of a techno thriller. Clive Cluster wrote it. Um, but they have this rare mineral that they could find. It's a pretty cool plot. There's, there's a missile shield that the United States is developing. And they need this special mineral to, uh, to power this missile shield. And the largest shipment of it that they know of was on the Titanic. So that's the whole motivation for going down, raising the Titanic and everything. And the hero actually finds out where, you know, they actually are able to get the mineral. And uh, without going into too many spoilers, uh, essentially the hero decides that if the, he brought the mineral back and the United States have an, had a missile shield against the Soviet Union, it would destabilize the Cold War and actually increase the odds of nuclear Armageddon. So they just leave it where it is. And that's, that's an example of that. But, uh, but, uh, getting back to crossing the return threshold, uh, when we were talking about all these threshold guardians, you know, that are, that are bad news, right? So when you're crossing the return threshold back in here, there, there's a couple of different things that are going to happen, right? So the, the road back is blocked. We talked about flight. We talked about uh, the road back, right? So these are some serious threshold guardians. They're going to stop the hero here because everything's on the line. If the hero is able to get past these threshold guardians, chances are, uh, it's curtains for the bad guys. You know, the the hero will have succeeded. So they're going to send the worst they can possibly send. So uh, uh, to jump back at A New Hope, right? This is Darth Vader. This is Vader. Um, Luke and his allies have rescued the princess. They're about to get away. And uh, Darth Vader blocking the way. And Luke's supernatural aid has to intervene in order for him to escape. A uh, sim similar thing happens in the Phantom Menace and the Phantom Menace. It's really obvious because they, okay. So the Gungan army has drawn off enough of the Federation's forces. Queen Amidala is able to get the commando team into the palace to challenge the Federation Viceroy. And then a door opens and literally guarding the threshold is Darth Maul. <laughs> it's like really, really obvious. Um, 
Another really good example is in the Fellowship of the Ring, uh, the Balrog of Morgoth. Even though it is Gandalf that utters the words, you cannot pass, it's the Balrog through action that is actually saying that. Because they're home free. You know, they could just run or fly, you fools, as as Gandalf says, right? Uh, They could just get out of there. They're right at the exit of Moria, right? What's stopping them? Well, it's a freaking Balrog that's not going to stop chasing him until it's taken care of. So, again, the supernatural aid, Gandalf, has to sacrifice themselves to get to get rid of this level threshold guardian. Uh, it's it's interesting to note that when the mentor character, supernatural aid or whatever, uh, buys it, it's usually right here in the story. When you're transitioning from Act 2 to Act 3. And if you're breaking up the circle into like the three act structure, we had act one being, you know, the ordinary world to crossing the threshold. Act two is that really long road of trials, you know, that leads through the supreme ordeal and everything to the other threshold. So this would be the start of act three. Um, and then, of course, you've now done flight. You've escaped. You've crossed the threshold. You've had your resurrection you've had your rescue from without you've had everything so this is the end you've triumphed you're the hero you return with the elixir that is the final stage of the hero's journey um and uh it's the end of our saga so it's like uh, having braved numerous tests and dangers and surmounted seemingly impossible odds our hero has brought back the much needed elixir back to the ordinary world Uh, They are now a hero with a capital H. They are not to be trifled with in the least. This is also known as the denouement sequence. Uh, When any open plot points of the story resolve themselves, they just they close them up very, very quickly. Uh, So quickly, in fact, that it can be it can border on dissatisfying. (laughs) And one of the movies I can think of where you're just like, wow, they wrapped that up really quick is Avengers. The whole Avengers like storyline really starts with Tony Stark in Iron Man, you know, where at the end, um, Nick Fury tells him, hey, we're going to start this thing called the Avengers Initiative, and you're part of a much bigger universe, etc. And then we have all the solo films, and then we have, you know, um, we have the, the Avengers. Well, who experiences the most growth in that movie? It's Tony, right? Who winds up sacrificing himself at the end to save New York and possibly the Earth. So he's the one that has changed the most. He's the one that has that actually returns with the elixir and he falls to the ground. And when he blows up the mothership, all the all the uh, Chitauri just die like they're battle droids or something. But they were organic beings. But but it's like Joss Whedon's like, hey, don't think about it. <laughs> like, it's, I need to wrap up this movie and get you guys out of the theater with a smile on your face and a spring in your step. So you don't think about what's going on. And so they they have all of them just just crush down and then you have the scene with the hulk and you know yelling at tony and bringing him back and then the shot of all the avengers cornering loki and then loki's taken back to asgard in cuffs by thor and movies over it's very 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 quick um so uh that's generally what'll happen is after we return with the elixir they'll have uh, a great thing and uh you know, this will be, hey, you know, we'll have a party. This is the Ewoks for, you know, Return of the Jedi. We're dancing, you know, with these little teddy bear cannibals and everything because we won. Yay. And or in A New Hope because we're going to we're going to drive that into the ground. That's the metal scene. You know, they're the hero is now master of both worlds. They're they're awesome in the ordinary world. They're awesome in the other world. Uh, they can handle anything. Right. So what comes next? Well, you're at the beginning of the circle again. Now, the hero's ordinary world is they're a hero. So, the best example I can think of is at the end of the Rankin and Bass version of The Hobbit. And it's an interchange that Gandalf has between himself and Bilbo when they're getting back to Bag End. And, uh, and, you know, he's, he's coming up to bag end and everything. And they changed the end from the, from the book and it still really works. So Gandalf says, yes, you will put your souvenir ring on the mantle 
and write the memoirs to your story, which you believe has come to an end. What do you mean believe it has come to an end? It has. Oh, Bilbo Baggins, you are a very fine fellow, and I'm very fond of you. But if you do not come to understand the true nature of that ring, other members of your family, not yet born, will. And then you will see that this story is not ending. It is only just beginning. And that's just a perfect way to, to encapsulate the whole hero's journey thing. And uh, I wanted to do like a, a small aside uh, attached to this because part of the hero's journey, and I've alluded to this, is preparing us as, as humans for stages of our lives or things that we're going to go through. And that is reflected through initiation rites. Um, Initiation rites are essentially the hero's journey in microcosm. And one of the best ones you can, I, you can find is the mystery cult of Dionysus in Greece. And there's actually like a stela and, uh, and some vases that show the different stages. So this, the, the initiate will step up, they will enter this cave, uh, they will be faced with, uh, guardians that ask them riddles they will con then consume certain things like bread and wine if it sounds if it sounds like the stages of the mass uh that's because there's a reason for that um but then they'll reach a certain point where they'll usually have to like inhale some kind of hallucinogenic or they get them really drunk or whatever but it will appear that they are about to die like or it, and it may be symbolic you know, it may be a symbolic, your old self is now dead, you arise with the new self, and and the new self arises, and when they walk out, they are, you know, accepted into the tribe, or they're, they're now viewed as a man um, instead of a child. Uh, in ancient Egypt, that would be where the, the, the hair lock of youth would be shorn from their heads, uh, all symbolism, you know, to show that this is different. And in modern society, we have essentially expunged all that. The only one I could think of that we actually, that we actually prepare young people to do as kind of a rite of passage is getting uh, your driver's license. Cause that is a rite of passage. After that, you know, you get, you go through these trials and you literally take a test <laughs> and then, and then all of a sudden you are free. You have a driver's license and you can do things that you weren't able to do before. Uh, that's in, in modern society. That's one of the few things I can think of. Um, graduating from high school is probably another one, uh, because at that point you're, mostly regarded as an adult uh, most people graduate right around the time they become uh, they turn 18 so you're mostly viewed as an adult and you're an adult but there's a lot of other things that modern society does not prepare people for uh that we just because we have devalued myth and and kind of mythical stories and we don't take them as seriously as we used to uh, people are stumbling into, into these stages, kind of willy nilly, unprepared, out of order, and the result is chaos. And so I know that like the millennial generation catches a lot of flack for you know, uh, being you know trophy kids and and all that stuff and everything, but that's not their fault. That's uh, that's because they literally did not have the myths or the mythic structure to initiate them through the trials and by giving everybody a trophy that's that's one of the ways that you devalue that um that's that kind of story like structure so uh and, and oftentimes also uh, i think we've become as a society overly sensitive to a lot of uh to a lot of initiation rights and sometimes rightly some sometimes wrongly but from an outsider who's not part of the tribe you know, from an anthropolo anthropological perspective, then the from the outsider, what will look like an, an what the insiders call an initiation, the outsiders will call hazing, and it, it's it's because they don't understand the 
they don't understand the mythic structure that whatever tribe has created. And one of the best examples I can think of of this is blood wings. And it comes from like airborne uh, in the military. When, when you get your parachute wings in the airborne, there used to be a tradition where people would get their blood wings. And that would mean that when you get the wings put on your uniform, they, they're little pins, you know, and they pin right onto your uniform and everything. And the person that would be pinning it on would punch the, uh, would punch the badge, your airborne badge, uh, as kind of their last act. And, it's, uh, and it was the last act of initiation of, hey, you're now one of the airborne, right? You've earned your wings. And some civilians who are not in the military and not in the airborne caught wind of this. And this was, I think in the, in the mid nineties, I don't know, but it turned into a huge brouhaha and the higher up brass pretended they didn't know anything about it. And we were appalled, right? Oh no, this is horrible. Um, but, uh, most of the military and almost all the airborne were pretty much like, uh, what's the big deal? Like, this is not, this is not a big deal. This is, you know, an initiation right, and you guys don't understand it, and you don't need to be involved. Now, granted, there are initiation rights that get out of hand and are, you know, and are proper hazing where people, like, die and stuff like that and fraternities and stuff like that. But I don't think it's any, it is not an accident that fraternities and different organizations have these kind of uh, initiation rights so that the the person who has now gone through the initiations the initiate you know uh feels as now that they are part of the tribe and they're going to they're going to be loyal to that tribe they're going to do all kinds of different stuff um and it can be used for good or evil um but just you know it's it's just one of these it's one of these things that is is still prevalent in society but it's it's become much much less formal and much less organized, and usually now it's usually kept secret because the eyes of outsiders to the tribe are everywhere, and the outsiders won't understand your myths. So I'm gonna end it there, and thank you very much for listening. Until next time, keep it clean and green. This is Mike. Out. Couldn't keep us from the sea. Here we stand, open arms. This is home where we are. Ever strong in the world that we made. I still hear you in the breeze. See your shadows in the trees. Holding on, memories never change. You have been listening to Quantum Froth Dispatches by Michael Haspel. Music and other cues are provided by The Fat Rat. The song you're hearing is Monody, featuring Laura Brem. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit www.patreon.com slash QFD. Thank you for listening, and we now return you to your mundane reality.